Well, it's a warm welcome to Natasha Mazzoni, who's the Democratic Alliance's Shadow Minister of State Security. And it's in that uh, uh, area that we're going to be talking about this morning. This morning. But uh, before we go into it, Ms. Mazzoni, I've actually interviewed your brother, Forty, who, who, uh, who was fascinating. Oh, it, it was an incredibly interesting interview that he and Grace Harding from Ocean Basket gave us in July this year. Very outspoken. Uh, so he became a chef. I, uh, I read that your dad was a chef as well. So, so he found his, his path early. You found your path early into politics. That's right. Uh, I, I started in politics when I was 15 years old. Uh, and I became the, I started out in the Democratic Party. And uh, I've, I was the Democratic uh, Party youth leader. And then in 2000, and the DA was formed, I became the DA youth leader. And at age 21, I became the youngest ever elected uh, councillor, city councillor in the country. And I was a city councillor in the city of Tswane for nine years until 2009 when I joined Parliament. Well, there we go. Cape Town load shedding. Uh, <laughs> I'm on my phone now, so hopefully you can you can hear me. Okay, we're back together. Uh, sorry about that little break in transmission, but we live in South Africa and we know how these things work. Uh, what was interesting to me was that you were the youngest member of the Pretoria Council. Now, the previous previous youngest member, I'm not sure if you know who that was, but he tells me Errol Musk, the father of Elon Musk, was the youngest member before you. So you've got big, uh, big shoes, if not for Errol, but certainly for his son to fill. Well, you know, uh, always up for a challenge. And Forty and I have never been a, a family to back down. We have a sister, Maria, who's equally a bigger character. And I'm the baby by 12 years. So in our family, my voice had to be the loudest if I wanted to be heard. So I think uh, I, I give them both a very good run for their money. So you were the chief whip of the Democratic Alliance. In politics, you guys understand what this means. But for people who are a little, out, a little removed from the political environment, what exactly is a chief whip? And then when you were made shadow minister, was that a demotion? Was that a, a, an intended switch? Yeah, so it was an intended switch, uh, certainly not a demotion, uh, a great a great position to hold, one of the most important positions, as you can imagine, in South Africa to hold. Um, I was always the corruption buster within the DA. Um, I handled state capture. I was the uh, the exposer of uh, the, the Gupta leaked emails, um, and I ran the ESCOM inquiry into state capture in Parliament. Um, I became the chief whip uh, mainly because uh, John and I had sat down and we discussed how best to stabilize the ship after Musi Maimani and Ethel Trollope had left uh, in the fashion that they had. And uh, we decided the best way to, to, you know, sort of make smooth sailing into our, our new party's format would be for me to be chief whip and John to be uh, the leader. Now, the chief whip's role is highly administrative. Um, and when you're in Parliament and Parliament is running normally, it can be quite exciting. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're in Parliament, uh, you're fighting across the benches, um, you're in Parliament every day having meetings uh, and negotiating with other political parties. But then, of course, the COVID crisis hit and I immediately became the chairperson of the DA's COVID Council, uh, which was a an exciting and frightening time and we had to make some very serious decisions of court cases that we were going to take on one of them that I was very proud that we took on was uh, to assist uh, restaurants being reopened uh, to workable hours, hairdressers being reopened um, and opening up the economy uh, in a safe but fashionable manner and we coined the phrase saving lives and livelihoods um, and then, of course, Parliament decided it was going to go back into a type of setting. Now, 
Unfortunately, what happened is that type of setting meant 19 members of the Democratic Alliance are allowed to sit in Parliament because we're sitting in a, a rather small chamber because at the 2nd of January uh, of this year, I woke up to a, a screaming uh, fireman telling me that Parliament was on fire. And I rushed to Parliament and I watched my, my beautiful home of 12 years uh, burn to the ground. So we now have our sittings in the Good Hope Chamber. So most things are done on the on the on the platform. Uh, people work in shifts because there aren't enough offices for people to be around. And at that, by this point, the the party had stabilised to the point where I, I said to John, um, "I think it's time for me to get back into the arena, back into the fight." And John agreed. Thankfully, I have a, a, a leader who is very understanding of of my needs as a as a as a politician, and where I'm best suited. And uh, things are not going well in our country. Corruption is not getting better. It's getting worse. I mean, we all heard what the president said on, on Sunday night. He knows that people are, are corrupt and they're going to investigate and self-correct themselves. Well, I don't buy that story. And uh, I said to John, you don't have a Condoleezza Rice. Um, and for a, a party like the Democratic Alliance, which is growing in leaps and bounds, that's bringing the ANC in many places in under 40 percent and who has to really make sure that we're politically stable and secure going into the 2024 election. I think we really need to look at the at the safety uh, aspects of our country. And uh, John and I sat down and we decided that the best place to put me would be in state security, but also create a new role to assist John as he goes around the country. So not only am I the shadow minister of state security, I'm also the national security advisor to the leader of the official opposition. And that means twice a week I give John a full briefing as to security issues that I think he needs to be aware of around the country and how as a party we're going to deal with them. So the July riots last year, it's its just over a year ago, and it uh, had a massive impact on all kinds of things, not least in the financial world as well. That would have been very squarely in your remit. Exactly. I would have I would have been one of the first to hear. I would have been on the ground. Um, I would have been gathering up intel from uh, our various activists who are on the ground. And one must never forget, it was the Democratic Alliance who was organizing, uh, basically took over organization of operations, uh, especially with our security forces, uh, uh, by informing the Army Defense Force and security forces as to where trouble was arising and where flares of trouble were, were starting around uh, KZN. John, right in the middle of the fray. Um, so, of course, my heart was in my chest constantly because, uh, you know, not knowing if John was safe or not, because at many times communication being completely cut with towers being shut down, etc. But that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to avoid in the run up to the 2024 election. We can't have another riot or July uprising. We cannot afford for anything to get in the way of having a smooth and safe and fair election in 2024. And when a ruling party that admits themselves live on TV through their president that they know that they have mass corruption within their ranks, there is a very good chance of there being attempts at disrupting the elections. And that's why it's more important than ever that the Democratic Alliance has a security advisor to advise our leader, but more than that has someone who is highly experienced in the field of dealing with corruption and dealing with how you investigate and uncover corrupt activities and knowing where and how to report these corrupt activities so that we don't wait 18, 19, two years uh, for, the, for, the, for the police to act on information that we receive. It's not just uh, corruption, it's also sedition, incitement, and that's why we're having the conversation today. Julius Malema has, has pretty much been saying what he wants to say, both in Parliament and outside of Parliament. And you're taking him on now. Why now? 
Well, the thing is, you know, I have I have taken him on before. I have laid charges uh, at uh, various uh, police stations across the country. Uh, we don't have the capacity in our police force for them to investigate charges that require um, a very specialized form of investigation, such as sedition, such as terrorism, such as such as treason, for that matter. And the agency that actually has the responsibility to investigate those particular types of activities is the state security uh, uh, um, this department. And the Act clearly sets out what the state security department can and must investigate. So it's been very difficult as, as chief whip your role is very administrative. So you don't have the ability to really go out, lay these charges um, and, and, and get the ball rolling. But now that I am in this, the position that I'm in, in state security and in an advisory capacity, the very first thing I did was the first month of being in my position, I went uh, and I learned everything I possibly could about the uh, state security agency and how the intelligence operation in South Africa actually operates. And now that I have a full grasp of exactly how it works, it's a lot easier for me to take Julius on in ways that I haven't known that I can take him on before. So I could go to a court and apply for an application, but you and I both know that in that court application, they'll write, write they'll raise points in limine, they'll ask for postponements, and so a court case will take uh, an, an absolute two, maybe three years to complete, especially when dealing with something like sedition, terrorism, incitement to violence, and we don't have that kind of time. And that's why I, I thought, let's do two things. Firstly, I think that it's very uh, easy to be brave when you're speaking in front of a crowd of your own supporters, because you know no one's going to stand up to you and you're going to act like the big man and, and you know, your supporters, unfortunately, are um, highly uneducated and you've given them a, a healthy meal to get them there in the first place and they are going to cheer you on and you're going to think that you have a power that you actually don't have. But secondly, um, uh, I think that the only way you really stand up to a bully is to bully them straight back. And I think it's about time as South Africans that someone stood up and told Julius Malema straight to his face that he's now an obvious fraud. I mean, the fact that he was in Ibiza uh, showing off his uh, very fancy DJing skills, uh, wearing his crisp white Gucci outfits, um, ha living his best life on yachts, while the people that he claims to support could never even dream of luxuries that he enjoys on a daily basis. They have no idea that these luxuries even exist. Um, it, it just really brought home exactly how badly this country needs to expose Julius Malema for the fraud that he is. Um, many a CEO, as you will know, uh, has fallen prey to this so-called uh, EFF mob mentality um, and and really given in to many of their demands and their claims. I am not one of those people. My party is not the kind of party that will back down. And I think what, what, what really matters here is Julius knows that of all the things in the world I could be scared of, the one I'm certainly not is I'm not scared of him or his party. So sometimes it just takes a bigger bully to take on a smaller bully uh, to get them to really realize that you mean business. And we are, you know, very, very close to an election. And it's, it, I just felt it was really time for a South African to stand up and, and say what we've all been wanting to say for a really long time. And believe you me, I think I held myself back very well in the letter that I wrote to him because there's a lot more that I want to say to him to his face. And that's the problem, Alec, when you're a politician, is unfortunately you have to try and be a little diplomatic and a little di uh, you know, um, diplomatically correct. But uh, there were a lot harsher words that I wanted to use than uh, just a fraud and, and bully. Um, but uh, Julius has got, a, has got a fight on his hands. And if he thinks that he's going to go around this country and terrorize people,
he's got another thing coming. And it was a great pleasure for me to be able to write to the South African uh, Safety and Security Agency and mark uh, directly from the act exactly what I think he has done and what kind of actions need to be taken against him. I think there are many people who would say yes about time. But on the other hand, South Africa has wonderful laws, including those that you have pointed out here, which are just never implemented. What makes you believe that this one is actually going to be implemented and that Malema will be taken to task over the kind of statements that if any other citizen of this country were to make would quickly land us in jail? Well, I, that's why I didn't bother referring him to the Human Rights Commission or going to the police to lay charges or uh, even going straight to court. That's why I've done it the way I have done it, that I've gone through uh, the Department of Safety, uh, State Security, uh, because now it's really at the top office in our country, which is in the office of the presidency. My letter went straight to Mondli Gungubele, who is now in charge, uh, together with Zizi Kodwa, in charge of state security. Um, and I've taken it to the very top. So, um, you know, are these laws going to be implemented? Believe you me, it's going to be the only thing that I, well, not the only thing, but the main thing that I concentrate on uh, is making sure that these charges are ventilated, fully investigated and acted upon. And there's a, so to speak, in state security, there's a new sheriff in town. And uh, I don't take on a, a fight that I don't think I'm going to win. And I do believe that I have a very strong fight in me. No one thought that I would be able to get an investigation going into state capture. And I managed to do it, which resulted in the Zondo Commission. And I think that it depends on the kind of personality that is taking a, a particular issue on. And I think I am the right personality and the right person to take this issue on. And I'm, I'm called the Rottweiler in Parliament. And I believe that I'm called the Rottweiler because once I grab hold of something, I simply don't let go. And this is an issue that is very close to my heart. And it's something that I feel very strongly about. I feel very strongly about the safety and security of the people of our country. And I'm not going to stop until Julius Maleme is brought to task. How will he be brought to task in your ideal scenario? Well, in my ideal scenario, he's going to be investigated for sedition, for uh, treason, and mainly for the main mandate of the state security agency, which is to ensure the safety, security, uh, and uh, peacefulness of the people of South Africa and South Africa as a whole also to protect the sovereignty of our country. Now, when you have a Gucci revolutionary tin pot dictator running around screaming revolution and saying that, you know, in a revolution, people must lose their lives, that is exactly the kind of mandate that state security needs to fight. So I would like to see state security do a, an investigation very quickly into some of the comments that he's made. I have sent them uh, the video in particular, which I think is the, is the most damning video. And then I would like to see state security do what they should do, which is put people that put our country and the, uh, uh, the people of our country at risk where they belong which is behind bars. I would also like to see them looking at the actual structure of the EFF as a whole as a political party and whether or not they fall within uh, the ambient of being a just political party that may take that, that may take part in a general election because there are rules and there are, are regulations. We've seen it with the uh, Black Lives uh, Black Life uh, a land matter where they were removed from the IC as a political party. And I think we need to seriously be looking at is the EFF a political party or is it a terrorist organization that is in the political realm, losing support, no doubt. We've seen that in all the recent by-elections, the last 15 that we've held across the country, losing massive support around the country. So we need to look at whether they're a political party or plainly a, a, a terrorist organization that for the last uh, eight or nine years has done nothing 
but uh, act as these tin pot dictators terrorizing South Africa and whether or not they even have a place in the political arena of South Africa. I'm interested in the point you made about the by-elections because I've also been following them quite closely. Where the EFF has come up directly against the ANC, it's actually won four wards. So I'm not sure uh, on how to interpret what you say, that they're losing support. Well, we look at the bigger picture. Uh, and of course, where you've seen them winning wards off the ANC is in the in the poorest of the poor areas. Um, and, you know, the, the, the problem is it's very easy for a, a, a madman uh, and, and a, you know, a, like I said, a, a tin pot dictator to put on a red overall, put on white gumboots, uh, you know, while he wears his, his Gucci outfit underneath uh, and go into these areas and claim to be one of the people. And when you have absolutely nothing and someone comes and promises you a home and a job and electricity and water, it's very hard for you to not believe that this promise could possibly come true when the ANC have been promising you the very same thing for 26 years and 26 years later, you're sitting in the same position or in many cases in a worse off position. So it's been in very few cases uh, where the EFF have won, and they've won because what they have to their advantage is a, is a very charismatic leader. And you have a cult mentality when it comes to the EFF. And that's always been in Julius Malema's favor, is that he is almost cult-like in the way he manages to get people to believe and to follow what he says. And it's the, the charismatic behavior that I think has led to the winning of those particular wards. But if you look at the at the greater scheme of wards and anywhere where he has tried to contest in an area where there are people that have had the ability to have any type of education, any type of decent uh, nutrition before the age of five, uh, and any type of uh, 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 education, access to the news, um, which is which means access to electricity and 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 television. You will see that his party has gone backwards, and other political parties have have really surged forward uh, in terms of the support that they did have eight or nine years ago. Because what I do believe is many South Africans who saw the EFF as coming up as as the the hope of the of the underdog, as the hope of the the pro poor, have now caught on to the fact that Julius Malema leaves these rallies, gets into a, a Discovery Explorer or a brand new Mercedes Benz, has an incredible amount of security that has been allocated to him, and does wear uh, fancy Italian clothing. Um, and people have bought it, you know, have realized that they, they've been buying into a complete sham and a complete fraud. Um, and that, that, I think, has happened uh, greatly across the country. So, yes, perhaps in four incredibly poor rural areas, he's managed to convince in a cult-like fashion people to vote him in. But even there, the turnout has been incredibly low. So he's definitely won on a differential turnout vote and certainly not on a new vote turnout. I had a really interesting chat last week with Gayton McKenzie, uh, and he referred to an incident uh, while he was campaigning with John Steenhuisen, your, uh, your colleague and leader of the DA, where John called him uh, a green gangster. Green, I guess, because of the color of what his T-shirt was and gangster because of his background. And he said, well, I just that's just politics. That's the way it is. Is this just politics that we're seeing that Malema is, is, is just doing political slogans and, and statements? Uh, or and, and your response to it, is it just politics causing a stir, being the one person who's actually the Rottweiler who's taking on little juju, or is there a heck of a lot more to this? Alec, I wish it was just politics, but there's a heck of a lot more to this. Um, juju is not uh, playing around when he says that he will incite a revolution. I wish he was, but he is not playing around. Uh, and it takes, uh, we saw how the July uprisings happened. It took a few people uh, causing absolute chaos to create uh, 
this massive mob mentality, uh, people joining in, burning down warehouses, uh, burning down, uh, bringing the economy of KZN into a complete standstill, uh, causing absolute destruction. It also started with one or two people uh, and then those who are just so desperate because of the poverty levels and the unemployment levels in our country joining in. Now, I'd like to take you back a couple of years and think about the H&M uh, incident, think about the clicks incident. It also took one or two uh, EFF members at these particular stores to cause mass havoc uh, at the waterfront in Cape Town, uh, in Sandton Shopping Center. It takes one or two people in a cult-like atmosphere to create absolute pandemonium. And as I said before, the EFF is like a cult a cult like movement. Without Julius Malema, the EFF doesn't really exist. There's there's nothing to it. There's no substance to it uh, other than its than its prime leader. Um, so no, this is not just politics. Uh, Trust me, it's it's not easy um, knowing that you have to look over your shoulder all the time, uh, knowing that you have to stay a fair distance away from your family because you never know when uh, someone is mad enough to to shoot a bullet and that bullet misses you and hits one of your one of your family members, or if a family member of yours is kidnapped uh, and held to ransom to try and shut you up. Uh, these are not games that we play. Uh, especially when you start getting to our level, when you start getting uh, the state security agency involved. Um, so these aren't political games that we play. Um, if Gayton McKenzie thinks that uh, these are these are games that we play and that we use these terms lightly, he's also deeply at fault. Um, and I think shrugging things off and saying, "Well, it's just politics," uh, is a is a term that is used far too lightly, and certainly in the South African context, can't be taken lightly, because we have too many. Uh, gangsters. We have too many people who are deeply corrupt and we have too many people who lust after blood in our country to take it lightly. You must remember that hatred can only be taught because as a nation we saw in 1994 and we saw during the transition of South Africa from an apartheid state into the rainbow nation that we're generally a peace-loving nation and we're generally a nation who gets along really well uh, and it's a few individuals that are causing these um, massive political um, instabilities. And these instabilities are being caused for a reason. There needs to be disruption uh, before the election for these political parties to have any hope of surviving or gaining any support before the net general election because they can see the kind of support that political parties like the Democratic Alliance are gaining because what we do is we hold the centre ground. We are the rational centre ground while well, you have the extremists to the left and the extremists to the right. You have the, the central rational ground of the Democratic Alliance in the middle. And that doesn't suit some people. So disruption is the name of the game. And that's why John's put me in the position that I'm in, because one of the things I do is I, I, I see this disruption before it hits and before it comes so that we have a pre-warning. And for example, we've done it very recently in Durban. Durban had a massive Kasatu march uh, that was planned for transport uh, at the at the Durban Ports Authority, and information was being leaked through to us about possible uh, violence that was going to erupt in the city centre. We managed to get that information through to the right security services departments, and we saw uh, the correct amount of riot vehicles coming out and stopping the violence starting before it began, because prevention is better than cure. And Alec, what we don't need is one week before the general election in 2024 for uh, riots to start breaking out like they did in KZN. Because I can guarantee you, your average South African will, will, will be more concerned with the safety of their lives than casting a ballot 
as would, as would any normal person be when casting their ballot. So this has gone far beyond a game of politics. This has gone to a, a game of life and death where we are now fighting not only for, uh, for political freedom, but for the right of South Africans to exercise their political right in a, in a manner in which they are safe to do so. Just to clarify, Gayton McKenzie was not talking about your challenge to Julius Malema or uh, your reporting of him to the State Security Agency. He was, it was in, in a conversation where he was mentioning, I guess, at the hustings, uh, something that John Stiena hasn't said about him. But it's uh, been a pleasure talking with Natasha Mazzoni, who's the DA's Shadow Minister of State Security, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.